so let's begin reading together here in uh, 1 John chapter 3. And um, let's see how much will I read. I'll read verses 1 through 3. 1 John chapter 3, beginning at verse 1 to verse 3. John writes, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Now, as we've been going through 1 John in uh, chapter 2, and now that we're entering into chapter 3, but in chapter 2, John had pointed out that, that God is righteous and that his children are also righteous. Notice in verse 29 of chapter 2, how it said, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And so as his children, our works of righteousness are pointing to something. Our works of righteousness are a visible indica indicator that we are his children. Now, what is it that has inspired and energized our works of righteousness? Why do we perform works that God would state are righteous? What is it that has inspired this? What has energized it? Well, it's his love. It's a love that has moved him to adopt us as his children. He desired us to be his children, and his love accomplished that desire. We need to remember, even as we introduce this passage, that righteous works don't save us. Righteous works are the evidence of salvation. When Paul was writing in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, Paul said, He saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So he saved us not because of the righteous things that we have done. And so we're saved by his grace. His love has motivated him to accomplish his desire for us to have fellowship with him. Now notice how he begins. This is something that you might want to take a moment to look at in chapter 3, verse 1, how he begins with the word behold. Behold. He says, behold, so we can more deeply appreciate how marvelous this is. He says, behold, look at this. Look closely at the incredible kind of love that God has lavished upon us. Behold this. Look at it. Look at it closely. Behold. And even as we sang a moment ago, I was thinking, behold is used so many times in Scripture. Like, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And even before... Behind me, behold, I make all things new. That means this is to grab your attention. Be aware of this. This is incredible. God has loved us, and God has demonstrated his love for us. And it's because of his love for us that uh, he has allowed us and made it possible for us to become his children, that we might be called, as it is saying in Scripture, children of God. And that, again, is something amazing, how that God actually identifies us and acknowledges us as his child. It's the incredible love of God. And, and it's incredible when you really think about it. It's incredible that God loves us at all. We don't deserve his love. And even in our best days, we're not that lovable. But God has called us his children. Behold, that's incredible that God would call us his children. Now, what did he do to make it possible for us to be his children? How, how great is his love for man? What can we use as a measurement that demonstrates the depth of his love for us? Well, the depth of his love is revealed by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul was writing to the Romans in chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, he said it like this. Paul said, rarely will anyone die for a righteous man though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But he went on to say, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were sinners. We were far away from him, and yet Christ died for us. And so how did we become his children? We became his children by receiving his gift. Around 20 years ago, my father-in-law 
passed away. My father-in-law, very, very, very dear man, very dear man to me. Good man, he was a good man. And um, he would come here when we were building the new sanctuary because he was a, a construct. He owned a construction business with his brothers, and he would come here on Fridays and he would just watch the construction. He had retired. And uh, so he had some time, and he would come here, and he would watch the construction. And he did it regularly, so regularly that it was expected that, that he'd be here on the grounds. And one Friday, he, he wasn't here. And so my sister-in-law and my son, Joseph, got concerned. And so they went to his house. And when they went to his house, uh, they walked in. Now, my son, Joseph, at that time, uh, was working in a, an ambulance service. He ultimately finished college and became a registered nurse. But at that time, he was going through some basic things and all, and he was working for a particular company, and he'd already been trained in a variety of things pertaining to, to uh, you know, immediate emergencies and all. And so he went to the house, and when they walked into the house in the hallway was my my, my father-in-law, and he had had a stroke. And so... Joseph took his vitals, told my sister-in-law, Patty, call 911. He was brought to the hospital. But before that happened, Joseph knelt next to him, my son, and he said to him, uh, Grandpa, are you, are you ready? Because he could see that this was indeed very serious. He said, are you ready? And my father-in-law knew what he was saying. So my father-in-law said to Joseph, uh, I'm a good man, Joseph. And in that, he was right. My father-in-law was a good man. And Joseph said to him, you are a good man, Grandpa. You're not good enough. He said, all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God, Grandpa. You need Jesus. And he began to share with him the gospel. And there on the floor in his house, my, my father-in-law gave his heart to Jesus Christ. And when I went to see him in the hospital, the first thing he did when I walked in and he saw me, he was he had that he had a stroke. He he tried to speak to me and he said to me, David, I, I got angry because he had been disappointed by a friend and it had gotten to him. And I spoke to him a little bit. I shared with him some things. Later on, I told my wife, I said, you know, I didn't realize what your dad was doing. He was making his last confession. That's what he was doing. He was looking for absolution. That's what he was doing. Because of the little time he had ever gone to church, he was one who would drive by the church, and that's pretty much when he went to church. He drove by it. <laughs> my mother-in-law was a more frequent visitor, but not my father-in-law. And so Joseph had prayed with him. He gave his heart to the Lord. He wanted to confess to me because he saw me as, as like a priest to him in that way. Well, he went home to be with the Lord a couple of days later, and then they had a funeral service in uh, Chino at St. Saint Margaret's. St. Saint Margaret's. And uh, several of us had opportunity to speak of the wonderfulness of my father-in-law. But the priest got up and spoke of him, and in his, his speech, in his speaking of him, he said, Andres, which his name, he really, we called him Reuben, so he called him Andres. He said, uh, is in heaven because he was water baptized and went on with how Catholic doctrine is. My son Joseph came up after the priest. And my son Joseph said, my, my grandfather is in heaven, not because he was water baptized, but because he gave his heart to Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior and shared the gospel with the whole family that was sitting there who had otherwise not had the opportunity to hear the gospel clearly presented. When you have the opportunity, you share the gospel because that's the amazing story of God's love for man. It is not works of righteousness which we have done. It's according to his mercy. It's by his grace that we receive salvation. God so loved the world, he gave his son, and while we were yet sinners, the scripture says, 
Christ died for us. And so we received that, that gift. It's a gift of eternal life. Like it says in John 1, verse 12, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. And so we have by faith received this free gift, and, and in doing so, we became his children. Behold, what manner of love that is. Well, as a result, notice verse uh, uh, 1, the second portion, the world does not know us any longer. This world system that we've already looked at does not recognize our value, who we are, and what we do. The world does not recognize us as its own. That's what that verse means. The world does not know us any longer. The world does not recognize us as its own. The world, in other words, rejects us. The world hates us, and the world persecutes us. You know, we look at the founding of this nation, and sometimes we look at the founding fathers, and we like to, to regard some of the things that they did and said and all of that. And I was looking at something Thomas Jefferson, who was uh, the, one of the founding fathers. He was the third president. I was looking at something Thomas Jefferson said. He said, or wrote, he said and wrote, the Christian God can easily be pictured as virtually the same God as the many ancient gods of past civilizations. The Christian God is a three-headed monster, cruel, vengeful, and capricious. If one wished to know more of this raging, three-headed beast-like God, one only needs to look at the caliber of people who say they serve him. They are always of two classes, fools and hypocrites. So before we begin worshiping the founding fathers, maybe we ought to remember some of the things that they actually said. Now, there's a man by the name of Aleister Crowley. He lived uh, 1875 to 1947, and he was what we would today refer to as an occult leader. And this is what Aleister Crowley said. He said, one would go mad if one took the Bible seriously. But to take it seriously, one must be already mad. And so the fact is, is the world does not own us as its own. I could give you so many citations of that. Those are just two examples. You see, Jesus in John 15, verses 19 through 21 said, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. There's an apologist by the name of Frank Turek. And he said, if Christians continue to rely on emotion and ignore evidence, they will continue to lose their children to secularism, half-hearted Christianity, cannot withstand rabid secularism. And make no mistake, secularism is rabid. The world isn't neutral out there. Today's culture is becoming increasingly anti-Christian. And so that's just what the scripture is saying here. The scripture is making it very clear that that is exactly what is being said. The world does not know us because it, because it did not know him. Now he goes on to say this, though, in verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we, we know that when he's revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So we have not yet been fully illuminated concerning everything that's before us. It has not been revealed what we shall be. So even at this time, it has not been fully revealed, but one day it will be. Somebody said, how pure and holy, intelligent and wise in our souls, how spiritual and glorious in our bodies, how exalted in dignity, how great in power, how rich in inheritance, how happy in enjoyments, how happy are we who have this awaiting us. You see, one thing we do know when he appears, he says, we shall be like him. We shall be like him. We will have glorified bodies. We'll be fully conformed to him. Paul in Philippians 3, 20 and 21 says it like this. Our citizenship is in heaven. 
from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he's able even to subdue all things to himself. No more diets in heaven. Isn't that great? One size fits all. It's just going to be wonderful. In, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, We all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You see in verse 2, we shall see him as he is. We shall see him in his glorified state, in his glorified body. No longer at that time will we be walking by faith. At that time, we will see him face to face. In Revelation 5, verse 6, the first portion of that verse uh, John said, I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. We will see him and we shall see him as he is. And, and if you have that hope in you, notice verse three, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. That is our motivation for living a life that is set apart for the Lord. We live lives that are holy. We, we live lives that are set apart for his sake because we long to see him. Now, somebody said John does not here speak of any man purifying his own heart because this is impossible. But of his abiding in the state of purity into which the Lord has brought him. So when we come to faith in Christ, we are brought into that state of purity and we remain there. We remain, we abide in him. And our lives are demonstrating that. In 2 Corinthians 7, 1, it says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So we anticipate being with him. And because we anticipate being with him, we live lives that are set apart for him. The way that, that a, a young bride-to-be sets herself apart. She sets herself apart. As a matter of fact, in the Jewish culture, she would be referred to as the one who is set apart. And so the Jewish bride would be set apart. She was waiting for her husband, and then ultimately she would see him face to face, and she would make herself ready for that. In, in, in our day, that's uh, sometimes um, not looked at as seriously as it was in, in previous times. Sometimes people actually get married in ways that really kind of like don't, reflect uh, the uh, sanctity of the marriage, let alone uh, its importance, you know, because sometimes people like to do things or be silly or whatever in their wedding, and they think it'll be memorable if they do such and so things. There was a time when, and, and there still is amongst many, uh, when uh, getting married was a big deal. You know, young girls would be raised in, in homes where moms knew that they were girls and would raise them in that way. And as they did so, they would be prepared. Everything in their life, in, in many young women's lives, so this isn't a, a stereotype, but many of you can say this is true. This is true. Um, the way a lot of us were raised. You know, what do you give to a two- or three-year-old little girl for Christmas? A lot of different things, but a lot of things. I've seen this with my own grandchildren. I saw it, we did it with my own daughters. And you give them a baby doll. You give them a baby and they will carry the baby, they'll drag the baby, they feed the baby, because that's something that they do. You know, and in little girls, they used to give them, you know, stoves and kitchen things, and they would play, and they would make food, and they, we gave them little, little um, you know, pretend uh, vacuum cleaners. And, and so now they're living their dream. <laughs> when they got married... Just kidding. <laughs> but they were prepared, weren't they? They really were. They really believed in, in true love. They really believed in marriage that last. They really believed in, in a man that one day would come and sweep them off their feet and, and love them forever. There's nothing wrong with believing that because there are plenty of men who will do just that. There's nothing wrong with believing that. And they would prepare themselves. They would prepare themselves for the wedding day. And the wife will go out and the wife-to-be, the bride-to-be will go out and she'll find a dress. And she'll, you know, 
Sometimes she'll feel the need to lose a few pounds and she'll put that dress on. And 10 years later, she just looks at it. <laughs> but the women, women go out and they, they purchase things that they keep. And men, we're different. Men go out and rent a suit that somebody wore last week. That's what we do. But women are different in that. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's beautiful. But they prepare themselves. And, and the wedding day comes. And it's really about that bride, isn't it? When the music plays and everybody stands and they face the door. And you hear the, the bridal song, dum, da, dum, dum. You know, and she comes walking. <laughs> And you put a chain on that groom so he can't get away. It's just a beautiful time for the victim and his bride. And so as, as that goes forth, there is a lot of preparation. And it's a beautiful moment. The uh, one picture that I have in my room, the one I, I have of uh, our wedding day, is when I first saw my wife when she came walking out. The photographer took a picture of my girl, and I have it on my desk, and I see that every day. Every day I look at that picture, and I remember the beautiful moment when I first saw my girl. And one of these days, there'll be a beautiful moment as the Lord first sees us. So we prepare ourselves. It's not that he just isn't aware of us, of course, but it's that moment that we're with him and all, and we prepare ourselves. And so... He's saying everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. We, we live a, a life set apart. We, we, we stay away from the things that, that will, will cause impurity in us. We, we don't play with sin. We don't mess with his grace. We, we just prepare ourselves. That's what believers do. And the closer the time comes for us to see him, the more prepared we want to be. And that's our hope. And because we have that hope, we... We do purify ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. We do perfect holiness in the fear of God. Well, as he continues in verse 4, he says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And so the world is divided into two sections, if you will. There are those who are the children of God, and there are those who are the offspring of the devil. And the characteristics of such lives are either righteousness or rebellion. You see, he says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. So he tells us what sin is. Sin, he said, is lawlessness. Now, the Greek language, is, uh, the word lawlessness in the Greek language, which the New Testament was written in, is anomia, 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 without law, lawlessness. It, it speaks of a contempt for and a violation of law. Why would he write that here after saying these things? Well, it would seem that the Christians are being influenced by false teachers and are being tempted to regard sin with indifference. You see, one clear earmark of a believer, we are no longer slaves to sin. The one who commits sin is a slave to sin, Jesus said in John chapter 8. He who commits sin is a slave to it. Well, we are no longer slaves to sin. Romans 6 verse 6 says it like this. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. The one we yield ourselves to becomes our master. And when we yield ourselves to sin... It rules over us. But because we have yielded ourselves to Christ, because we have given ourselves to him, he now rules over us. And we have the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us and has given us freedom. And one of the earmarks of a believer is freedom in Christ. Now, there is much confusion about what it is to be free in Christ. Someone said it like this. They ask the question, what then is the nature of true liberty? Not being free to do anything you want to do, but in coming to the place where you delight in the performance of what you ought to do. You see, there are mistaken understandings of the liberty we have in Christ today where people 
you know, I've been in the ministry for a while. I've pastored this church for a while. I can tell you this as a fact. I've been in the ministry for 49 years. I, I guess I have a little experience in it. And I can tell you that over the years, on more than one occasion, I have encountered people who think that liberty is the freedom to do whatever I want and still go to heaven. That came out of the Gnostic religious faith that had come upon Christianity and had imported its beliefs that you could do whatever you want with your body. That's called docetism. You could do anything you want with your body, and that doesn't infect the spiritual person. But that's not true in the sense that we are free. That is true, but not to continue in sin. We are free, so we're no longer slaves to sin. And that's what the Bible teaches very clearly. We aren't indifferent to sin, and we, we don't indifferently practice it as a way of life. You see, what he is saying here is whoever commits sin, that word commits there, that word in the original language commit speaks of a continual habit. It speaks of abiding in, as a regular way of life, continuous rebellion. It's living in sin as the habit of your life. It's not that you can't on occasion sin. All of us do in word, in thought, in deed. It's a regular thing. None of us will be free from that, that, that ability until we see Jesus face to face. But at the same time, there are those who think, oh, no, it's no big deal. And so he's saying this, whoever commits sin is really a slave. Again, speaking of a way of life, he's saying that, a false Christian's life is not free from the entanglement of sin. Again, we, we sin as Christians, but we don't practice it. We don't indifferently practice it as a way of life. Someone said, it is one thing for sin to live in us. It's another for us to live in sin. So believers no longer continue to practice sin as a way of life, but false Christians do even when deceived into thinking that they aren't sinning. There are cult members whose outer lives can sometimes look better than the life of believers. I remember when I first got saved, because I came out of uh, the rebellious period of that day as a hippie and long hair and barefoot and the whole nine yards. You know, if you put me next to a Mormon young man and you asked who's the Christian, the average person would have pointed to the Mormon kid because they wore their hair short and all of that. And me, I looked like a grubby guy. I didn't wear shoes and things like that. So there's always that, that outer appearance. And sometimes you can be part of a religious group that has outward appearance of righteousness. And uh, you can be looking at this guy over here, or this woman over there, and you can be thinking, that person couldn't possibly be a Christian. It was amazing to me, and I won't speak too long about this, but it was amazing to me when, you know, people started getting tattoos and all. And, and in this fellowship, you know, um, I had somebody, an employee who was working for us who, who had tattoos. And, you know, and people were upset. People got upset. Guys got tattoos. Well, see, there was a time when, you know, motorcycle gangsters and people in prison and sailors, people like that. They got tattoos and, and people would say, oh, that's, that's a rough person. But that time changed. But, but what's interesting to me was how people was, would treat. I even had to, this is years ago now, I felt the, the necessity to, on, on more than one occasion, to, to remind the church that you don't judge people by outer appearance. You know, I used to tease about it. Some of you heard me when I'd say this, you know, because there was this phrase that was used. I don't even know if it's still used. Uh, tramp stamp. Is that still used? Is that? I don't know if it's used. Yeah, remember that? It's tramp stamp. It's got tramp stamp, right? I really didn't know what that meant. I did hear it. But it was on the lower back. So I teased the church. And I said, some of you girls are putting hummingbirds on your back. I said, they call it tramp stamps, and the church kind of giggled over that one. I said, you know, and it might be cute right now. You've got this hummingbird, but your skin stretches. And one of these days, you're going to have a vulture. So be aware of that. <laughs> and I used to tease them about that. And so when you walk, it's, it's going to be flying away. 
Yeah, we get caught up in the outer appearance. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And I shared the, with the church, you know, that, uh, and I still do, obviously, I'm doing it right now, is to judge a person by outer appearance is always wrong. You may see the outside, but you don't see the heart. So look to the heart. And how do you know what the heart is? Well, you really don't know, but you do know this, that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So that can be one of the ways that you're aware. And another thing would be the way they live, how they are. And so when you combine the things that they're saying with the things that they do, you have a pretty good opportunity to, to understand whether they know the Lord or not. So somebody may have an outer appearance because the cult members had an outer appearance. Some of them were rigid, ascetics. They had an outer appearance of holiness, but their life still is lived in a lawless way. They, they, they are really not abiding by the rules of the Lord in their life. And so he says, whoever commits sin, whoever practices it as a continual way of life is lawless, is without law, and sin is lawlessness. But he goes on in verse 5, you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. So God provided a way for us. Jesus, who takes away, he carries away our sins. Jesus was manifested, he says. That speaks of the fact that he took upon himself human flesh. That relates to the incarnation. And he, he took upon himself flesh that he might take away our sins. Remember in John 1, 29, behold, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Or in 1 Timothy 1, 15, this is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. So Jesus was manifested to take away our sins. He came to bear our sin. So a life of habitual sin is incompatible to a relationship with Jesus Christ. The result of understanding this is freedom. When we understand that Jesus bore away our sin as the Lamb of God and that we in Christ have a new life empowered by his spirit and directed by his word and spirit. When we understand that our, our, our sins have been completely forgiven and, and, and that God has given to us, yes, commands, but he also gave us the power to obey them through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that this really, in many ways, rests on who we, our understanding of who we are and our desire to do that which pleases him, our life changes. And that brings to us freedom from bondage to sin. In 1 Peter 1.24, it says, speaking of Jesus, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, listen, that we having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Having died to sins, when we continue to practice sin with no sense of remorse, it's been said it's like kissing the tip of the spear that was plunged into the side of Jesus. And when you love the Lord, you don't do those things that displease him. You see, sin is incompatible with Jesus because in him is no sin. Jesus is that perfect offering. He goes on to say in verse 6, whoever abides in him does not sin, does not practice or continue in it as a lifestyle. Whoever sins continues in it, has neither seen him nor known him. So sin is no longer compatible with our deepest desires. We love the Lord with all our heart. We desire to please him. We're actually what the scripture would refer to as a disciple, one who is thoroughly in love with Jesus Christ, and we can no longer enjoy sin. We can no longer just do something, forget about it, find more sin to do. That doesn't happen. It, it, it's not that, that you become sinlessly perfect. It simply means that the conviction of the Holy Spirit is so great in your heart that when you do something wrong, you're grieving over it. You grieve over it. Before you were saved, it didn't matter. You did it, you enjoyed it, and you looked for more. But when you got saved, you may have stumbled into it or chosen to do it, but it wasn't enjoyable anymore. It wasn't what you used to get out of it. Now you have nothing but grief and sorrow of heart, and you say to yourself, how did I do this? I don't want to do this anymore. And at a certain point, 
you actually cross over mentally, you understand why is it that I didn't like that? I didn't like that. Because it's wrong. And because I love Jesus and I want to please him. And that's what happens. So he's saying whoever abides in him, when he uses the word abide, it, it speaks of a permanent abiding. So whoever abides permanently, it could be translated in him, does not practice sin. Sin is no longer compatible with our desires. He says in verse 7, little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Don't allow people to seduce you into error. You have responsibility not to be deceived. Let no false teacher persuade you that a child of God still practices sin and God accepts that. Again, even to this day, some false teachers say sin isn't really sin. As a matter of fact, they're in the business of redefining it. They're making it acceptable. Sometimes they legalize it, and in legalizing it, it makes it acceptable not only to, to individuals but to an entire nation. We know that. We've seen that. In Isaiah 5.20, woe unto those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That's what we're living in right now. We know that. I'm not going to preach a lot about that. You're aware of that. We're living in that time where evil is good, where darkness is called light, and where bitter is called sweet. You see, these false teachers were teaching that a believer could continue in sin and enjoy it. That was compatible with the way the world had operated but we're not to be that way. In Colossians 3, 5, and 6, Paul said, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Now he speaks in verse 8. Interestingly, notice how he says, he who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. He who sins is of the devil. In other words, sin originated with Satan, who was the first rebel against God. When he said he who sins is of the devil, Satan is the fountainhead of sin and the originator of rebellion against God. In John 8, Jesus said it like this, verse 44, when he was speaking to some religious opponents, he said, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he's a liar and the father of it. That's heavy. He's a murderer. And a liar. That's what Jesus said. So a person who is following the Lord isn't going to practice sin because the ones who practice it as a way of life actually belong to the enemy. And he said, for this purpose, the Son of Man was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The word destroy, for this reason, the word destroy means to loosen or untie. It speaks of releasing or breaking. It speaks of dissolving. Jesus was manifested to release captives from Satan's control. And the way he did this was by giving himself as a ransom. In Matthew 20, 28, he said, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6, there's one God, one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony given at the proper time. In Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Um, I don't want to seem to be callous and uncaring, and it certainly can appear that way by what I'm going to say. But I do believe that one of the things the enemy used, especially to his, to his own benefit, was through the COVID um, situation the United States has gone through and continues to. 
is he actually opened up my eyes to, to, to the reality of, of many who have a fear of, of death. Because after all that, and I don't want to make a long story out of this, just, just an observation. Because after all this time, all the, all, all the research is finally coming in and various things. If you watch the news and try to stay up on all of this, you'll see that there are a lot of things that are coming to light that were at one time hidden for whatever reason. But one of the things that I did see is how easily it was for people to, to wear their masks, even when they're in their car or when they're walking outside by themselves. And, and I certainly don't want to, to judge them with a broad brush because un, undoubtedly there are many who, who may have had contamination, didn't want to uh, infect others, and I give them grace and charity for that. On the other hand, there are some who wore it simply because they were afraid. And the fact is that, that Jesus came to free me from that fear, the fear of death. What's the worst thing that would have happened to me? I had it twice. My wife and I had it twice. What is the worst thing that would have happened? There's no worst thing that could have happened. The best thing could have been I'd have been to be with Jesus. That's, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. You know, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Again, don't presume on the grace of God. Don't do something silly or don't do that. But don't live in fear either. Don't live in fear either. Do you know Jesus? If you know Jesus, if you know Jesus, you're going to go to heaven. You're, you're going to go to heaven. Well, I want to go, but not right now. <laughs> yeah. And I've heard these young people say, I, I don't want to go right now. I hope the rapture doesn't occur. I want to get married. So you'd rather go through hell first. <laughs> anyway, I'll keep going. We don't have to be afraid. So whoever has been born of God, verse 9, does not sin, does not practice or continue in sin. For his seed, God's seed, remains in him. He cannot sin. You cannot sin without a sense of conviction. You cannot sin because he's been born of God. So we are God's offspring. God's spirit has created an entirely new life, a life that glorifies him. We cannot continue in sin, not because it is impossible for us to sin, but because the spirit within us is grieved when we do. The conviction of the Holy Spirit comes upon us. We turn from that. It is no longer our way of life. And then finally, verse 10, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest or openly revealed. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not, does not love his brother. Okay. We'll close with this. John is actually giving us a test to reveal the believer or the unbeliever. He says, the unbeliever does not practice righteousness. In other words, he doesn't, she doesn't desire to live a holy life, a pure life. Because sin is their way of life and they enjoy it. In Psalm 10, verse 4, the wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. So sin is their way of life. You can speak to them. They don't want to hear it. Keep your religion to yourself. He doesn't want to practice righteousness. But... At, but another earmark is that he doesn't love. He doesn't have love within his heart, doesn't love his brother. A believer loves habitually. And we love those who are members of the body of Christ. We're family. And that love is manifested in, in various ways, like Romans 12, 10, where he said, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor, prefer one another. Or Galatians 5, 13, brethren, you've been called to liberty only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So you prefer one another. You're kindly affection to one another. These are things that earmark or demonstrate that you know God. I'll say this briefly, and then we'll close with one last thought. Somebody, I've, I've heard this so many times, and so many, seriously, even recently, so I'll say it to you guys. I, I've had people say this to me. They have said this, and I'll kind of gel a a lot of comments over the years, they say one thing that they have seen in our fellowship, and I'm so blessed to say this to you. They said, they said, Pastor David, your church is a very loving place. 
And, and it is. It is. We have our share of stinkers. That's, that's true. <laughs> but who doesn't? But our, our, no, our church is... Our church is a very warm place. I love our church. You know, I tell you that because I mean it. I don't say that just to say it. I say it because I mean it. I love our church. I don't know everybody, of course, but I love our church. And when people come in, and just last week when I was in Downey, I was part of, um, of a service honoring and, and blessing uh, Jeff Johnson from Calvary Downey. People were telling me that. I love your church. You've got warm people, loving people, your staff. You know what? You guys are great. I love you guys. I really do. And this is from my heart to yours. I love you guys. You're, you, you, it makes, it's a joy for me to be able to come on a Wednesday and talk to you. It's a joy. I love it. On Sunday mornings, I love it. To be able to see the family, to gather together, to enjoy each other's presence, to love Jesus together. And that's what Christians are, right? Is we love one another. That's what we do. Jesus said that's how people will know we belong to him. He's just saying that, that our faith is, is revealed in the way we live, in the way we love. And the believer will be known by their love for others. Uh, in chapter 4, we'll get there, verses 7 and 8. It simply says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. That's one of the songs we learned to sing when I was first saved. He loves not, knoweth not God, for God is love. When you are connected with the God of love, your life changes. Your life changes. It really does. When you have a belief in a God who is never satisfied with your efforts, you will never have peace. You'll never have joy. You certainly won't experience love. You'll be too busy trying to be good. But when you understand that in spite of what you are, God has loved you. In spite of what you are, he sent his son for you. Even in your best day, you're not good enough. When you understand that, and yet he loves you anyway, changes your life. Changes the way you think, and it changes the way that you live. Because we worship a God who has loved us. We love him because he first loved us. And that's how it works. And it works well. And the unbeliever does not live a righteous life, and nor will he live a biblically loving one either. 